Let's look at some of the Norse sagas and what they can tell us about the details of Viking combat. Hi folks, Matt Eason here of Scholar Gladiatoria. Now this video is inspired by a uh, video that I've been watching on History Hit. More about that in a minute, they're the kind sponsors of this video. In 865, a massive Viking, if we call them that, um, so uh, probably mostly Danish at this point, army invaded uh, northern, northeastern England. And this of course was catastrophic for Anglo-Saxon England and had far-reaching consequences. This was a period, the so-called Viking era, where raiders from Scandinavia had been raiding for several uh, decades before this, uh, all over um, northwestern Europe and beyond in fact. But this 865 was very, very significant because they came with a huge force and started to settle. And this was the period which uh, started the period of uh, what became the Dane law and the establishment of a, uh, should we say, Norse or Viking, if you want to call them that, uh, period of rule in parts of England. Now we know an awful lot about the dates and the names of the people involved but we actually don't know huge amounts of detail. Archaeology has helped. We found mass, mass graves and burials um, and we know from various sources in different countries some more detail about some of the individuals involved. But when we talk about Viking combat or Viking era combat we're left to fill in a lot of gaps with a lot of conjecture. However, a great set of sources we have to look at are what have been um, variously described as the Viking sagas or the Norse sagas. These are a collection of sources which come from places like Iceland and Scandinavia that talk about, for the most part, legendary or mythological stories, so things that have been passed down orally. Now many of these were actually only written down in the 12th, 13th or 14th centuries, but they're referring to oral stories which have been around since, in some cases, the 8th or 9th century. A comparison in the Anglo-Saxon world would be something like Beowulf, for example. So, we have these stories which have come down by oral tradition, given, uh, told from, uh, from person to person, and then eventually they were written down. Now what's interesting is when we look at these stories, and we have to caveat them with all sorts of cautionary um, advice when we use them as source material, you can actually glean some really interesting details about period combat. And I do want to reiterate that using these as source material is fraught with difficulties because these were written down a long time after the events, so they might not always describe equipment of the the period that they're supposed to be set in. They might mix in things of the time when they were written down. There's a problem of language and terminology and the way it was translated. A lot of these were translated into English quite a long time ago or have been translated by numerous people in slightly different ways. So the names for objects uh, can vary between translations and things like this. So they are problematic sources and they are things which have magic and mythological elements to them as well. So they should really be taken in the light of, like you might think about, Greek mythology. Now before we dive into some examples of combat uh, descriptions from these um, so-called Viking sagas. I just want to mention that this video is sponsored and very much inspired by History Hit. And if you want to learn more about the Vikings or in fact any other bit of British history or world history, then History Hit is an amazing resource for you. And I've got a special offer for you, for you here, which you can take um, advantage of yourself or it might be a great gift. If you adore history and basically want to watch history documentaries all day and listen to podcasts about history all day, then History Hit's the place for you. Imagine taking all of the sorts of history documentaries that you love watching on TV and putting them all in one place. That's History Hit. It's basically like Netflix, but only for history. It's got hundreds and hundreds of hours of content right now, and it's forever growing and expanding. And you can access it anywhere. You can listen on your mobile phone, podcast for example, while you're traveling, or you can watch it on your television, or your laptop, or your desktop computer. And History Hit's managed to attract world experts on their topics with unique content that you will only find on History Hit. As well as the new programs that they're adding all the time, there's also a whole bunch of new podcasts being ad added on a regular basis, which includes the award-winning Dan Snow's History Hit. Now, as mentioned, this video today was actually inspired by a documentary I've been watching called In Search of the Viking, the Great Viking Army of 865, incidentally, which was an incredibly important event in English history, and you could say in world history as well to some degree. And it's a great documentary. It sort of outlines everything we currently know from history and archaeology about that invasion, and it's In Search of it is looking 
looking for the evidence, both historical and archaeological, for that massive invasion in 865. It features Dan Snow and other leading experts, and they actually travel to locations that were pivotal and key in the invasion of 865. Anyway, I'm sure that you want to check it out for yourself, and I've got a great offer for you here, and it's on screen with the code Scholar Gladiatoria, and that will give you 50% off for the first three months. Great offer, unique to this channel, the code Scholar Gladiatoria. 50% off for the first three months, and you can also get to that via the link below down in the description. So for just a few pounds or dollars per month, you can get access to absolutely tons of history content that is continually growing. So check it out now, and thanks once again to History Hit for sponsoring this video and the channel. Right, so now let's get back to the main content of this video and look at some combat accounts from these Norse or Viking sagas. So this first example is from Cormac's saga, and this is an often cited, and I think, with in the sphere relatively well-known example. However, I think it's important to start off with it because it is about a what we would call a judicial duel. So this is a duel to, to settle an argument essentially. So this is a Viking duel. Now, luckily from the sagas, we know about these. It's a great example of where we, if we didn't have these sources, we literally wouldn't know about this tradition at all. Um, and so essentially this is the uh, whole gang uh, duel, um, whereby two people fight each other with sword and shield on a defined area. Now the defined area is very interesting. Um, it, it, some people have argued it could be um, on an island or on a sheet as we're going to see here, but the fact is that it is a delineated area and this carries on into later judicial duel traditions or trial by combat um, traditions in Europe which go all the way through, in fact all the way to the Renaissance and we see in the fencing treatises with barriers. Uh, so it's, this is the roots of it, it's an old Germanic tradition and we know that there were different versions of the tradition in different areas. So what we're seeing here is the sort of Norse version but we know that there were similar Anglo-Saxon, uh, you know, Franconian, uh, Frankish, there were different versions um, of the tradition. So uh, this is a duel essentially between Cormac the, um, the titular hero and Bercy and they have both interestingly borrowed swords for the duel. Now that's an interesting thing so I'll just grab a Viking sword here. Viking swords of course would have been highly prized and highly treasured items and I think a comparison that you can make here perhaps is in the world of Japanese swords so a lot of these swords in Viking tradition seem to have been heirloom objects and sometimes not even sword sometimes a, uh, a sax for example so these sorts of weapons seem to have been handed down very often from father to son or, or sometimes from friend to friend and also sometimes they were buried and that's why we find them in the ground they were buried with their owners sometimes and we see in these sagas sometimes people go into graves to retrieve swords with all sorts of consequences to retrieve swords from people that have been buried with them because they were a famous sword and deemed to be useful and we should also say there is a mystical and magical and mythological element to these swords. And we read about the, uh, the worm or serpent in the blade, which probably is an allusion to pattern welding. Um, so if we look at this uh, sax, for example, just focus on the blade for a second, you can see it has a pattern welded blade. And these um, were seen you know in magical terms in some cases so these objects weren't just hunks of metal to their owners they were also seen as apart from being very expensive they're also seen as having a spiritual um a spirit of themselves really actually almost a, a spirit in the sword and they were to be used in certain ways and respected and held in reverence so very, very foreign and different to later medieval period where a sword is just a sharp piece of metal for the most part. Okay, it might represent justice and, and law and things like this, but for the most part it's uh, just a sword. Whereas in this period they were held in more reverence. Right, so let's get into it. Um, so... Uh, uh, Cormac answered, I should fight no better even so, I will run the risk and stand on equal footing with thee every way, as thou wilt, said Bercy. It was the law of the Holmgang that the hide that they're going to fight on, the surface, should be five L's long, um, with loops at its corners. Into these should be driven certain pins with the heads of them called uh, tsonnur, um, 
he who made it ready should go to the pins in such a manner that he should see sky between his legs holding the lobes of his ears and speaking the four words used in the rite called the sacrifice of the chunyu. Um, so it goes on about how the area should be prepared and again it's a m sort of spiritual and mystical and reverential process. Right, now let's get into the um, actual fight. And the rules were this, each man should have three shields, and when they were cut up, he must get upon the hide if he had given away from it before, and guard himself with his weapons alone thereafter. And this is very, very interesting because there's a lot of debate about how much swords were actually used to defend with. Um, in later periods, when we look at some people like Sir Richard Francis Burton speaking about um, Arabs using swords and shields, he makes certain assertions I don't necessarily agree with, where he says they only defend with the shield and only attack with the sword. In this case, we've got clear evidence of the fact they're talking about, yes, you defend with the shield, but when the shield's broken, you can defend with the sword, and we'll see an example of that um, after. So. He who had been challenged should strike the first stroke. That's a very interesting thing, and it's something we see carried on into the later medieval period as well. It's symbolic. If one was wounded so that the blood fell upon the hide, he should fight no longer. So it was a first blood duel. If either set one foot outside the hazel poles, um, he went on his heel, they said, but he ran if both feet were outside. His own man was to hold the shield um, before each of the fighters. The one who was wounded should pay three marks of silver to be set free. So the hide was taken and spread under their feet. Thorgils held his um, brother's shield and Thord um, Ard Ardinanson, um, uh, that of Bersi's. Bersi struck the first blow and cleft Cormac's shield, so he broke the shield. Bear in mind that Viking shields at this time are actually relatively thin and relatively fragile. They're quite light, fast objects. Um, uh, Cormac struck at Bersi, in reply, um, to the like peril, so he also broke Bersi's shield. Each of them cut up and spoilt three shields of the other, so they'd broken the three shields that they each had. Then it was Cormac's turn. He struck at Bercy, who parried with witting. This is one of the swords, I won't go into details, but this is one of the swords that's been borrowed. So it's explicitly stating that he parries with the sword, which is an interesting detail. We don't know how he parried, but he parried with the sword. And that just by itself is an interesting thing to know. Um, Skufnung cut the point, that's the other sword, cut the point off Witung. Um, in front of the ridge. Now, don't really know what that means, um, <laughs> but it might mean that the fuller ran up to a certain point here and it, it, the ridge might be the fuller, maybe. Um, but anyway, it's broken the tip off. Um, the sword point flew upon Cormac's hand and he was wounded in the thumb. The joint was cleft and blood dropped upon the hide. Thereupon, folk went between them and stayed the fight. It goes on to explain what happens with the wounds and what happens with the swords, how the swords uh, are, obviously one of them's had the tip broken off. Um, another one subsequently, the other sword gets thrown down on the shield and gets a notch in the blade. So these are all symbolic um, sort of representations of these swords being damaged, they tell a story. But nevertheless, here's an interesting detail. So we, in this story, we hear about a tip being broken off and we also talk about, an, we also read about a notch being made in a blade. That potentially tells us that these are quite hard and brittle points and edges. That doesn't normally happen with modern spring steel. However, if we're looking at swords where they are differentially hardened, a bit like a Japanese sword, for example, where we've got a very hard cutting edge and a very hard tip, but a softer back or softer core, and that can also happen as a result of having a pattern welder blade. So you will notice that this has pattern welding up the middle, but then has mono steel on the edge. So what can happen is we end up with a pattern welded softer core, which is resilient, but a very hard and brittle edge and point, which is great for cutting through flesh and bone. But if it hits hard objects like a shield or like another sword, then it can be damaged. And we see this with Japanese swords as well. And Japanese swords often lose chips out of the edge or um, lose the tips as a result of hitting other hard objects. So this is telling us not only about the rules of the fight and the duel and the way that they fight and the way that they do sometimes use the, the sword to parry, not just the shield. It's also telling about uh, potentially about the durability of the shields and it's also telling us about the durability 
of the swords and weapons used. Now in another fight Cormac is uh, involved in, it's, uh, it gives an interesting detail actually about, the, about what happens. And he says, so uh, then they set to, Cormac's sword bit not at all, in other words it didn't cut. And for a long time they smote strokes one upon the other, but neither sword bit. At last Cormac smote upon Thorvard's side so great a blow that his ribs gave way and were broken. He could fight no more, and thereupon they parted. Now, it, it's, that's a very, I don't know what to make of this. So the, the, I don't know whether this is just symbolic and the fact that uh, the fact that Cormac couldn't get his sword to bite is some symbolic uh, thing, or are we talking about sword here which just isn't properly sharp, or is his edge alignment bad? There are all sorts of questions and we'll never know the answer. Um, or indeed is it to do with the clothing being worn. Um, so I talk a lot on this channel about uh, cuts and actually how making a decent cut with a sword is not as easy as you might think uh, and how also clothing can prevent cuts uh, penetrating through. So I think there's a whole bunch of questions raised by this, no answers unfortunately, but nevertheless it's an interesting piece of text and shows that sometimes uh, people hacking away with swords failed to cut, we see this in the Crimean War uh, for, uh, accounts for example, were failed to cut but their impact could have an effect nevertheless, in this case breaking the ribs. Now there's another related uh, fight here where he says, so they went to fight and Thordis met Thorvard now as before but Cormac sought no help from her. She blunted Cormac's sword so that it would not bite. This is very interesting a reference to blunting a sword. Um, but yet he struck so great a stroke on Thorvard's shoulder that the collarbone was broken and his hand was good for nothing. <laughs> so again, we've got a reference here to a sword deliberately being blunted. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, uh, and But nevertheless, it being effective to end the fight because of it disabling someone's arm. Now, another topic we've looked at in various videos is to do with accessing swords, getting them out of scabbards and scabbard mishaps. And this is what we have here. So it says, once upon a time after a battle, Cormac was driving the flying foe before him when the rest of his host had gone back aboard ship. One of the woods there rushed against him, one as monstrously big as an idol, a Scot. And a fierce struggle began. Cormac felt for his sword, but it had slipped out of its sheath, or scabbard. He was overmatched, for the giant was possessed, but yet he reached out and managed to catch the sword and struck the giant a death blow. Then the giant cast his hands about Cormac and gripped his side, squeezed so hard that his ribs cracked and he fell over, and the dead giant on top of him so that he stirred no more. Now whether this story is true or not is kind of irrelevant because yet again it kind of reminds us that these basic realities of in a scrap, in a fight, your sword falling out of its scabbard is something that's been happening ever since swords and scabbards existed. Here's another example of a sort of universal truth of combat. Bad luck in this case. Now came those brethren to the garth, and Kettle was the swifter, the quicker, and leapt over it into the mead. But whereas Gisley um, leapt at the garth, a turf fell thereof, and he slipped. Therewith came up Bardi, who was the swiftest of those men, and hewed at him with the sword Thorgout's loom, and hewed off well nigh all the face of him. <laughs> um, and this is just a simple case of two people fighting and one person slipped over and got his face chopped off. Um, and this is yet again a reminder that, you know, when we're talking about the specifics of Viking combat, you've got to remember that some, a lot of the things just would have been universal to all combat. One person falls over, they're screwed. Now looking at the Volsunga saga, there is a nice story about a smith and a hero trying to get the greatest sword. Now a theme that we often see in these sources is swords failing their owners. And this can often be symbolic, it can often be to do with the, the fact that the, the hero or, or a character, should we say, lacked certain virtues or didn't obey the rules, didn't listen to the advice, and so therefore they paid the price by their sword breaking or getting notched or not cutting properly or whatever. So there's a big allegorical element to this. But nevertheless, it shows us that the durability of blades in this period was something that was obviously highly prized and also something that people worried about a lot, something that was a very, it was a 
a reality for them that many, many swords did break and therefore their owners lost their lives. This is even something we see in the 19th century still being talked about. So there's this story about uh, Sigurd basically um, getting Regin to make a sword for him, but the, he, every time he tries to test the swords, they break. And um, this is very interesting because it's one of the earliest references that I have found um, to testing of sword blades. So quite simply, if someone makes a sword blade, you're not just gonna go, that looks brilliant, I love it, here's the money, bye bye. You're gonna test it. And we even see this uh, going all the way through to the modern era with um, how swords were tested for the military. But even, you know, say for example, in the age of the small swords, small swords were advised to be tested by pushing them into a wall to check their flex and check they re returned to true and all this kind of stuff. So people were testing swords before they trusted their lives to them. And eventually, after breaking swords that Regan made, um, it, finally he got a good one and it says, then Sigurd smote, smote it, the new sword, into the anvil and cleft it down to the stock, down to the wood thereof, and neither burst the sword nor break it. Now, obviously, I would say, I guess you could find some ways of explaining how this could be a true story, but nevertheless, it, this is, I think, an allegorical story about cutting an anvil in half with a sword, but it's really about proving a sword, putting it through a tough test and proving that it works. Um, so it didn't break. Then he praised the sword much and thereafter went to the river with a lock of wool and threw it up against the stream and it fell asunder when it met the sword. So in other words, he put the wool in the stream and the blade and when the wool came along purely with the force of the water, it cut. So this is a sword that didn't break when it hit the anvil like previous ones had, and um, it was so sharp that it cut wool purely with the force of the water itself. And then it says, then Sigurd was glad and went home. <laughs> I would be too. Now the hero Sigurd with his amazing sword goes on to do fantastical great things. And here's just an example of that. This is an example of legendary combat. So there are things that we can glean from it that might be interesting or useful for the study of historical combat, but you have to bear in mind this is a legendary godlike hero who does things which no mortal should ever really be able to do. And it says, and now when the fight was long due in such wise, uh, uh, Sigurd goes forth before the banners and has, and, and has the good sword Gram in his hand and smites down both men and horses and goes through the thickest of the throng with both arms red with blood to the shoulder and folk shrank back before him wherever he went. Nor would either Helm or Bernie, that's a male shirt, um, hold before him and no man deemed he had ever seen his like. Um, so cutting through helmets and armour is the thing I wanted to highlight here and this is something that we see in heroic combat and we see in heroic art. So oftentimes when people are looking at medieval manuscripts they go oh well look there's a sword or an axe there cleaving straight through an entire knight's body through the helmet and the, the mail shirt and whatever armour they're wearing. This is heroic combat, this is not something that can actually be done. Not to say that you can't compromise armor with a very strong blow. And you know, sometimes there's a skirmish or a melee, a battle, and one person saw a helmet break under the blow of a sword, and that story becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. The size of the fish becomes bigger and bigger in the telling, and it becomes their entire body and the mail shirt and everything else. And this is how oral traditions establish and these legendary tales. So yes, absolutely, sometimes armor helmets can be compromised by sword blows or axe blows or whatever. Um, but we should bear in mind that's certainly not the normal reality. You know, just to give one more example from the same tale with Sigurd here, um, this is, he says that therewith he takes the helm off his head of him and sees that it is no man but a woman. Um, and she has been clad in a burnie or some male shirt as closely set on her as though it was a gown on her flesh. So a very tightly fitting and svelte um, male shirt. So he rent it. Uh, cut it from the collar downwards and then the sleeves thereof and ever the sword bit on it as if it was cloth. So again we're talking about this legendary sword which is able to cut through an iron mail or chain mail shirt like it was cloth. This is, this is describing a magical Excalibur like sword so it's interesting, but also we should bear in mind, what does this tell us? This tells us that usually a male shirt 
that wouldn't happen because otherwise this wouldn't be described in a fantastical and legendary tale. Now Sigurd's magical sword, should we call it magical, um, it's called Gram. Um, there's one other tale that I, I just really like the description of it, so it's the last one I'm going to share of it uh, with you. But um, so Sigurd is lying asleep in bed and Guttorm came in and drew his sword and thrust Sigurd through the body in such ways that the sword, that his sword point um, hit the bed beneath him, so it went through his body. And Sigurd awoke with that wound, I'm sure he would, um, and Guttorm gat him unto the door, but therewith S Sigurd caught up the sword Gram in his hand and cast after him, and it smote him on the back. So I think that means he threw it um, and smote him on the back and struck him asunder in the midst, in the middle, um, like Darth Maul, um, so that the feet of him fell one way and the head and the hands fell back into the chamber. <laughs> so he literally cut him in half. So again, legendary magical sword. Now here's a combat account from the Aya Biga, sorry for my pronunciation, saga. And this is a more, I think, believable, less fantastical tale. So it says, in that very nick of time came up Thorin and his folk, and Nail was the foremost. But when he saw them threaten with their weapons, he blanched and ran forth and up into the fell, and there became one witless with fear. But Thorin rushed at um, Thorbjorn and smote his sword into his head and clave, cleft it down to the jaw teeth. Now this is actually something we have archaeological evidence for. Not this particular tale, but similar ones. So the fact is that chopping a head down to the teeth absolutely is doable with a sword if there's no helmet there. Um, and we have skulls where that has happened. Then Thorir Ernson with two others set upon Thorin and Halstein and another on Elfgear. Um, Odd uh, Kath Kathleson uh, with another man gat on to a fellow of Alfgear's and three of Thorbjorn's fellows on two of Thorin's folk. This is very, very complicated, very specific. And the fight was joined both fierce and fell, but so their dealings ended. And Thorin cut the leg from Thorir at the thickest part of the calf and slew both his fellows. Now, um, it does go on, but I'm going to stop there. What's interesting is, just like the cut down to the teeth in archaeology, we also have loads of examples from archaeology of legs cut through, particularly from this period. So we do have uh, skeletons <coughs> from the Battle of Stamford Bridge, for example. Um, and it seems that leg wounds, the same thing with the Battle of Visby, it does seem that leg wounds were particularly common, I think, due to it being the age of shields. And for anyone who's done any sword and shield sparring, you will know that uh, two of the prime targets against someone who's holding a shield are the head and the leg. Because the middle of the body and the thigh and the groin are covered by the shield most of the time. So very often you're going between these high line and low line targets. And indeed the calf, the shin, is the bit of the leg that you can get to um, around the shield the thigh is better covered. And there's another detail to this. If you yourself are using a shield, it makes going for the legs safer. We see this in later treatises where uh, Fiori with a long sword tells you not to go for the lower leg because it's too risky because you're just using a single sword. But then if we go forward to Morozzo, Sword and Rotella, we see that the leg becomes a target because you can cover your high line with the shield while you go for the leg. So, for these two reasons, both defensively and offensively, I think that these are very realistic targets and anyone living at this time and being familiar with shield and sword combat would recognise that head cuts and leg cuts are something that happen an awful lot. And indeed, legs can be completely severed with a sword, we find it in archaeology, and indeed, swords can travel all the way down through the skull and stop at the teeth because we find this in archaeology as well. Now to return briefly to the interesting topic, interesting to me anyway, of the quality of swords, we have an account here that talks about um, a sword not functioning as it should essentially. So then befell a great battle and Stainthor was at the head of his own folk and smote on either hand of him. But the fair wrought sword bit not wherever it smote armour. In other words, 
it wouldn't cut through armour. Well, swords don't usually cut through armour, but nevertheless, I guess they're saying that it just it wasn't working that day. And often he must straighten it under his foot. So that's an interesting, that to me suggests a sword that's basically not hard enough. Um, so it's probably on the soft side and uh, it's bending when he's hitting into armour. And this again reminds us that weapons at this time were things which could break, they could bend, they could fail to cut, they could fail you. So the quality of weapons and the investment put into finding good spears and swords and um, saxes and things like this was extremely preoccupying activity for great warriors or kings at this time because it could literally mean the difference between life or death in the worst case scenario, or just simply being effective against your enemies or not really being very effective. Now this is a lovely deal, detail from the Lax de la Saga, um, which actually relates to several things I've done in videos in the past, most specifically the Pilum testing video. And this says, before they met, Kyatang flung his spear and it struck through Thorolf's shield above the handle. So bear in mind a Viking era shield has a shield boss. So you've got an iron boss with a grip on it, wooden grip usually, um, and then it's wood above and below that. Um, so above the handle, so it hit the wood. Um, so that therewith the shield was pressed against him with the impact and the spear piece piercing the shield and the arm above the elbow where it sundered the main muscles, the bicep I would imagine, although I guess, you know, it says above the elbow, so I would guess it was the bicep. So this is an interesting point here where, a, you know, obviously the spear is hurled, the person's either been holding or put up their shield in order to block it, it's pierced through the shield anyway, which I've demonstrated can certainly be done with uh, thrown javelins, and wounded him in the arm. Um, uh, in the main muscle, Thorolf dropping his shield and his arm being uh, to no avail to him f through the rest of the day. So yeah, it's a nasty arm wound through a shield. So it's always a good thing to remember that yes, shields do a fantastic job, but they can be penetrated by very powerful weapons. They can be split by swords and penetrated by things like arrows or javelins. So we're gonna finish off with a really detailed and brutal account from the same saga as the previous example. And um, this is uh, got so much detail in it. So then Anne went into the dairy hard and swift and held his shield over his head, turning forward the narrower part of it. Okay, so he's holding it like this, like a roof with the um, a point, with the bottom point pointing forwards. Bolly dealt him a blow with Footbiter, that's the name of his sword, and cut off the tail end of the shield and clove Anne through the head down to the shoulder. So right the way through, so he's chopped through this. So this is maybe legendary combat, maybe not. It's interesting that he says through the tail end of the shield. This might imply this is a kite shield, a Norman era shield, or it might just simply mean the bottom edge of the round shield, we don't really know. Anyway, so it cuts through the end of the shield or glances off it maybe in reality, and down through the head, down to the shoulder. Then Lambie went in. He held his shield before him and a drawn sword in his hand. In the nick of time, Bolly pulled footbiter out of the wound where that his shield veered aside so as to lay him open to attack. In other words, usually you keep a shield in front of you. If for some reason you're doing something that means you've gone up with this, he's now open to attack. So this is describing real fencing tactics and, and um, techniques essentially. So Lambie made a thrust at him in the thigh, and a great wound that was. Bolly hewed in return, chopped in return, and struck Lambie's shoulder, and the sword flew down along the side of him, and he was rendered forthwith unfit to fight. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And never after that time, for the rest of his life, was his arm any more used to him, so completely disabled. Um, uh, bear in mind, of course, medical science of the time, wounds like this are often just, you might live, but you might not ever be doing any fighting ever again. At this, uh, at this brunt, Helgi, the son of um, Hardbein, rushed in with a spear, the head of which was an L long and the shaft bound with iron. That's super interesting. Now, it could be that this is a form of angon. This could be where the shaft has got an iron strip bound around it, which we see sometimes in art. We don't know. When Bolly saw him, he cast away his sword and took his shield in both hands like a door, 
and went towards the dairy door to meet Helgi. Helgi thrust at Bolly with the spear right through the shield and through him. Now Bolly leaned up against the dairy wall and the men rushed into the dairy. Um, Haldor and his brothers to wit and Thorgard went to the dairy as well. Everyone's in the dairy. So um, this is a really detailed account and it gives so many details about the weapons, about the kind of wounds that would be expected, the fact that someone could be badly wounded and they might not die from it, but that basically means they're never ever going to fight again. But also again we sh see a shield, in this case penetrated by a spear, enough to penetrate the person behind as well. And this, of course, when we're reconstructing historical martial arts, you should bear in mind that these very light and relatively thin shields of this period are great for defense and great for deflecting and this kind of thing, but they're not infallible. They're not unbreakable. They can be penetrated. And so this does affect sometimes how we should see them interacting with weapons. And if we go back all the way back to the first source I gave here with the renting asunder of three shields per person in the, in the duel, in the sort of Viking era duel, these are perishable items. So shields were designed to be light and fast, not, don't imagine a great big heavy barn door, they are supposed to be light and fast and they might get penetrated, they might get destroyed, uh, but hopefully they'll do their job. But therefore when we're reconstructing martial arts we should think about things that don't just hold them there necessarily like a static object but sometimes are pushing aside and deflecting rather than thinking about it as uh, something just to stop like a door. Anyway, I hope these sources have been interesting. There are a lot more, and I could, if there's an appetite for it, look at future ones in future videos, different sources, different accounts, uh, different details that some of these sources bring up. There is a wealth of information in there, and while a lot of it is fantastical, legendary, mythological, uh, and it was written down hundreds of years after the point, the fact is we still do get really interesting details about combat in these sources, and they're an amazing resource, and they also remind Mind you that certain fundamentals of combat, like falling over <laughs> or smacking your head on a doorway, are things that run all the way through history, regardless of whether you're a Viking in the 9th century or whether you're a uh, person in you know 18th, 19th century Europe. Uh, a lot of these things are just universal truths. Anyway, I hope this has been fun to watch. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. Check out the links below and I will see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.